Tonight we have, of course, Gary and Jan Sauer and Athletes in Action with us. So I'm going to uh, just pray, and then we will, I'll turn the mic over to you, and, and then you'll turn the mic over to, well, Gary's going to come up after that, I believe, and we'll go from there, all right? All right, join me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for the day that you have made. We know it's a unique day. Today we want to rejoice. Lord, we want to use our life, the strength, the energy, the mind that you have given to us for your honor and for your glory. I think about all that's taking place in this building that you have blessed us with. Lord, thank you for the Iwana. Thank you for the summit teams that are here. Lord, the nursery workers, the Bible Institute class that's going on, the healing journey, and even what's taking place in this room. Father, I pray your spirit would minister into each one of our hearts in a special way that you would draw us near to you. Help us to see your word tonight. Would you illuminate the truths and these testimonies and all that is said and done in this place? We really do look unto you, Father, as the author and the finisher of our faith. God, I pray, I pray for little Kelly and ask that you'd heal this little girl and is in the hospital. Lord, I think of Joe Reminder. I ask your blessings on him. And Lord, I know we have uh, many within our church family dealing with cancers, dealing with sicknesses and hurts and pains. God, we bring them before you and we trust you. Lord, we don't want to lean onto our own understandings, but really do want to see you do a work, your work in each one of their lives. So God, uphold us and give us the strength, give us the grace, give us the courage to follow after you this day. We ask for your presence now. We ask your will to be accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Jan. Thank you. Well, good evening. For those that don't know who I am, I'm Jan Sauer. My husband Gary is going to preach tonight. And we're with the Ministry Athletes in Action, and we serve at the College at Brockport. And um, we minister primarily to the athletes. And the way we try to build trust with the students and the coaches and also build relationships with them is by serving the team. So we do various things. And, and many of you have contributed either your time, your money, your resources. Um, but we've provided care packages. We do dinners and different meals. We've done um, team building events, which gives us much more time with the team. And... Um, Coming up, we're going to show you a video that our daughter Michaela put together of a team building event that we did this August with volleyball.
these are three of the gymnasts from Brockport, and I'm going to have each one of them introduce themselves to you and just tell a little bit of what we've done for their team. Hi, everybody. My name is Chanya. I'm a sophomore at Brockport. And what Athletes in Action has done for me and our team, they help provide food and snacks, or such as when we go for six-hour bus rides to the competitions, they would give us chips or Gatorade for the bus or anything we would need. And then if we had home games or home competitions and the dining halls are not open in the morning, they would give us breakfast like bagels and cereal and orange juice, whatever we need for the mornings before our competition. Hi, my name is Hayden. I'm also a sophomore at Brockport. Another thing Athletes in Action helps us with is stuff like team bonding. Um, some of the things they've done with us is a simple picnic or bowling or the picture that you see is us at Rock Ventures. Each event really helped us like learn about each other, our strengths and weaknesses, and each, each event really was a great amount of fun. Hi everyone, I'm Amy. Um, another thing Athletes in Action has done for us is um, they've given us a chance to do Bible study, which is, which is really great, especially for college students that might not be able to go out and really look at churches to find one they like, or if you're like us and don't have a car, you can't really get places but Jan's been able to um, come on campus so that we don't have to drive anywhere, and it's very personal, and it lets us grow in our faith with our teammates. Hello, I am uh, Jan's husband. She runs the ministry. I just set up things like this for her. And uh, uh, we are excited about what the Lord's doing out in Brockport, uh, these ladies. Um, many of you had a chance to meet just about the whole team about a month ago when they came here and helped serve the Wednesday night dinner. And then uh, proceeds from that is what allowed us to put on their team building event. So uh, as Jan said before, and as we've said to other people, if God does not move you, we cannot move for God. If God does not uh, encourage or direct someone to either volunteer to help us with one of these activities or to give or to pray, uh, we can't do uh, what we want to do for God. So we want to say thank you to all of you. Um, as you leave out in the lobby, we've got our display set up. If you'd like to get our newsletter and our emails about what we're doing, uh, we encourage you to stop by the table and get signed up for that. All right. So Jan, you want to? I know Jan's got to get over to Healing Journey. Uh, the ladies are staying. They're very nervous about being in the front row. Um, so I made sure I did not have dinner to cause any issues uh, for them. Um, you know, it's, it's like adopting 600 people is really what it's been like for my wife and I. To have the opportunity to have these athletes in our home, to be at their events, to do things with them, and just, just do life. Do you realize what the second leading killer of 18 to 25-year-olds is? Suicide. Second leading killer for me at that age group was trying to do some of the exercises they do. <laughs> but in the years that have passed since then, that's what's happened. They just need to know that somebody loves them. Amen. They need to know that somebody cares. And it's such a blessing, not only... You know, they see uh, Jan or myself or Michaela um, out at these events and things, but they know what you're doing to demonstrate the love of Christ to them. So we just want to say thank you for making it possible for us to, to be there. So uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, just uh, turn to the book of Job. I was going to uh, think, I was thinking about preaching on Thanksgiving, being thankful, but Pastor Kevin stole that one Sunday morning. I was thinking about teaching on the five love languages, but I guess some other guy named Gary is going to do that tomorrow night. So we're left uh, with this message. And um, you can, okay, I'm back in control here. There we go. 
Uh, so our title for tonight's message is Leaving Room for God. He's a lot bigger than we think. And uh, I would much rather preach on being thankful or preach on the five love languages. Um, and you'll see as we get into the message tonight, it's one of the ones that uh, if you've ever had to speak, uh, you understand the responsibility as it says to, you know, you've got to make the work right within and then you take it without. And so uh, we'll see what the Lord does with this in our lives in the future. How many of you have read the book of Job? Okay. How many of you have attempted to understand the book of Job? Okay. How many of you have found the book of Job confusing? Okay. Do you know why? It's confusing. It, it is just confusing. I mean, um, I've had the opportunity to teach it in our Bible Institute, and, and I guess that was the impetus to saying, boy, I better dig a little bit deeper in here. Uh, but, but let me, I think I've got something. This should clear it up for you. You all set? Okay, You're good to go. Okay, get your phones out, take a picture. You don't write anything, right, ladies? You don't write anything down? You just take pictures of everything. Take your notes and everything else. So doesn't that, now it's clear as mud, right? All right, if that's not doing it for you, let me try this one. How about that? A little more detail. Now, it says the book of Revelation, but a lot of that has to do with uh, the book of Job and the tribulation and end times and all like that. So now don't you feel a whole lot better? All right. So because we're going to use some terms that may not be familiar to a lot of Christians, I do want to take just a moment and explain a little bit about the setting for the book of Job. And uh, if you're familiar, 2 Peter 3, Psalms chapter 90, uh, there's a verse there that says that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years. And how many days did it take the Lord to create the world? Okay, six days, and then what did he do on the seventh? He rested. So that is actually God not just telling us that to him a thousand years is nothing. To him, a thousand years is just a day, like to us. So he tries to give us an idea of what eternity is like, but there's something else there, and he's teaching us a pattern or giving us a picture of how he marks time. In Old Testament, we have 4,000 years of human history. Uh, New Testament, we're at 2018, and so we're going on a little more than 2,000 years of New Testament uh, time, and that makes up the six days. And then at the end of the six days, it's very interesting when Jesus uh, speaks during the Gospels, he says, in two days I shall return in two days. He didn't come back in two days, did he? But if you remember that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, those two days represent the 2,000 years. Now, the exciting thing is that means we're pretty close to having him come back. Amen? Uh, now, uh, you know, we'd all want it to be 2,000 from zero, and then they give you the whole, well, he was really born in 4 B.C. or something like this because the calendar changes. All I know is if he died in 2033 or in 33 A.D., we've only got to 2033. Take four years off for the calendar change, 2029. By then, some of you, uh, you may have your credit cards paid off, so you've got some things to really look forward to. But he is coming back soon, is he not? So this is a general timeline. We've got 4,000 years of the Old Testament, four days, two new, and then the millennium is when the rest will come, the seventh day he rests. And then what is, does anyone know what the number eight stands for in Scripture? New beginning. So the eighth day is eternity, and then we have a new beginning. Amen? So this is the period of time that Job really focuses on. And that is what we refer to as the rapture, or the time period in between the rapture and the second coming of Christ, and that's referred to as the tribulation. In general, when we say tribulation, we refer to all seven years, but specifically, the book of Job uh, has to deal with the last three and a half years, what's referred to in Jeremiah as the great tribulation, uh, or the time of Jacob's trouble, and Revelation, the great tribulation. So that's really the 42 months that are in that three and a half years is what the book of Job focuses on. Uh, it's very interesting. The book of Job has 42 chapters, one for each month of the second half of the tribulation. 
Uh, book of Job is the 18th book of the Old Testament, which is three sixes, which is the mark of the beast. Uh, Job refers to himself as a man-child in chapter 3, uh, it, which is direct correlation to the man-child born in Revelation 12. So Job is a, just a, a, a huge picture of what life will be like in the tribulation. So that's when we use those terms, that's what he's referring to. And then after that is the second coming and then the millennium. So let me tell you about the main characters. Job means one persecuted, one persecuted. And with as many hands as raised, uh, the raise that you've read the book of Job, you know that he went through a great deal and he was greatly persecuted. He is a real person. Some of the scholars would like to say he's just an allegory. Uh, if you go through the New Testament, you'll find out that every parable of Jesus that is a parable, no one's name is used. So anytime there is a true story, Jesus will use that person's name, such as the rich man and Lazarus, where the rich man ends up in hell and Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. Some of our friends with the little green Bible would like to say that that's just an allegory. It's not a real story, but yet Jesus uses Lazarus's name. So Job is mentioned 52 times in Scripture, which is very interesting. Four times 13, the number of testing times a curse. Does God know how to put a Bible together? So Job is mentioned 52 times in Scripture. He is a real character, a real person, and he's a picture of several things. Christ on the cross, the Jews in the tribulation, lost man in hell, and then a Christian under persecution. Now, how many of you have ever watched more than one thing made by the BBC? Whether it's one of their TV series, whether it's a movie, a docu, whatever, okay? It's okay. Go ahead. You can raise your hand, sir. Don't be ashamed. All right. He's looking around to checking. Am I the only one that watches the BBC? Have you noticed with the BBC, they only have like 25 actors? You'll see them in one TV show, and then you'll watch some other movie made by the BBC, and like half the cast was in the last one. And then you watch something else that they put on, and you go, wait a minute, I know that, what did we just watch, Scooter? The Guernsey Pie Literary Society, you know, it was about the uh, British island that was taken over by the Germans in World War II, and how people got to do clandestine work under the name of this, you know, so, and we looked and we were like, half of those people were all in Downton Abbey, you know what I mean? So it's like, they just, re they recycle them, put a mustache on, grow the hair out, do something like that. So when you read the book of Job, one of the things that'll help you get more out of it is to realize that these guys, of course, we know God, we know Satan, we know Job, Elihu is the author, and that's found out in chapter 32, and then you have these three supposed friends that come to visit Job in his misery. Uh, you've got uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Uh, Eliphaz was the first teamster. Uh, Bildad was just a little short guy. And the last one there was a big Jets fan. And these three guys supposedly show up to be a comfort to Job. And it's interesting, in chapter 16, Job says, miserable comforters ye all. And really, that's what they were. Friends like this, you don't want to have in your hospital visitation program. They are not good. Oh, you know why you're in the hospital? It's because of this sin, this sin, and this sin. So these are not good guys to have on your mercy team in your church. But throughout the book, what will happen is they will say things. Pastor Kevin, I just got to ask you to, excuse me. I noticed what, how long you've been a pastor now? Huh? Two years, all right. It seemed a lot longer. Uh, two years, and um, I've noticed that like when other guys preach, somebody takes a picture and takes a quote out of their message, and you post, you've never done that. I mean, has there not been anything? in any, How many times have I preached for you? Yeah, you're saying too many. Um, so here's, here, here's the quote. I mean, who's take, who takes the picture for that? Are they here tonight? No, they're not even here. You didn't even have them ready. Yeah, all right. So here's the quote. Everything in the book of Job is true, but it's just not right. Yeah, put that on Facebook and see how attendance goes Sunday. <laughs> Everything in the book of Job is true, it's just not right. In other words, they would say something, specifically like to Job, they would say something to him that if you just took the statement and read it, it's a true statement. 
but it did not apply to Job. And so that's where the confusion, they accuse him of stealing from widows and taking things away from the fatherless and not helping people unless he got gain from it. And Job's, you don't have to get the camera, buddy, just, it was only a joke. Um, and you go throughout the book of Job and they say things and, and you can almost think that Job was really like that, but he was not. But you take that statement and use it in a different context than it would fit. So that's why sometimes it is confusing. But also, each one of these people, Bildad, you go to, I forget what, chapter 6, maybe Bill, or, or maybe a little bit later, chapter, he does this little five or six verse thing, and it's like, what planet are you on? It does not fit the setting at all. But God is using his words to teach us something else, something as far as like prophecy or some other doctrinal. So that's why the book can be confusing because they're saying things and it's like it doesn't fit the conversation, it doesn't fit the context, but God is giving us a picture into what the tribulation will be like for the Jews who are out in hiding and everything else. So these are the key factors, the key players, and here's Here's another thing that will help you. Tonight's message is not just for tonight, but the next time you read the book of Job. This will help you see that God is giving us a greater picture than what's happening with these five guys sitting on the ground there, uh, three of them greatly criticizing Job. When you see the word innocent or righteous or poor or afflicted or oppressed, that's just not talking about an individual that may be afflicted by something. That's talking about the nation of Israel while they are in the tribulation. So as you read through that passage, you get a better idea what life will be like for them. And then if you see the word hypocrite, oppressor, unrighteous, or wicked, that's not just talking about some wicked guy in the neighborhood who steals kids' Halloween candy or puts razor blades on apples. Those are telling us what the Antichrist will be doing in the tribulation. So the book is like... You know, one way of explaining is like, remember those things called overheads? Okay, I know you guys are like, well, they're in a museum. You'll see them someday. You take a tour. It's where like you have this one sheet that goes on the overhead and it's projected and it shows the mountain ranges. Then you put another one down, it's the rivers. You put another one down, it's the cities. That is the book of Job. It is the biggest onion going where you just keep peeling back layer after layer after layer And then the picture starts becoming a little clearer. So, the doctrinal application for the book is that it is the nation of Israel in the great tribulation. So if you are in the book of Job, go to chapter 1. Hopefully some of that will help you uh, next time you do read through. So Job chapter 1 and verse 6, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, these are satanic angels, and Satan came also among them, and the Lord said unto Satan, whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Here's Job down on earth, minding his own business. If you read earlier in the chapter, uh, he had such a, a, a walk with the Lord that he used to do sacrifice or offerings for his children, not even knowing if they sinned. He said, just in case my kids may have messed up, I'm going to perform this sacrifice so that they're covered. Obviously a little bit different in the Old Testament than the New Testament. So that's the kind of man he was. So he's minding his own business, and God wants to pick a fight with Satan. And he picks Job to do it. Doesn't that stink? Job wasn't down there cursing God. Job wasn't down there running, you know, some illegal operation or anything else. He feared God, he eschewed evil, he was perfect, he was upright. And God says, I want to give the devil a black eye, and I know how to do it. I'm going to pick a person. And he picks Job. And Job has no idea of this conversation. He will find out soon, but he has no idea of what's going on in heaven. 
So Job was picked by God to pick a fight with Satan. But Job wasn't doing anything wrong to cause that. So you see there, um, and he says, verse 9, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job uh, fear God for naught? In other words, he's only doing it because you bless him. Hast, now, uh, hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Hmm. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Isn't that a blessing that before the devil or the world can do anything to you, they have to get permission from God? As bad as what happens in this book and what happens specifically to Job is, we benefiting several thousand years later know that the devil had to get God's permission to do that. And so we see here, Satan comes back from his little visit with God, and uh, he starts right in in verse 15, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away, talking about all of his oxen and his asses, kills all his servants except one, and he runs back to tell Job. 16, he loses all of his sheep and all of his servants but one. 17, he loses all of his camels except uh, one, and then one servant comes back to tell him, and then the final straw is 19, verse 19, where Job loses all 10 of his children, seven sons and three daughters. What is Job's response to this? Verse 20, then Job arose, rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground, and worshiped. I don't know. I may have tapped out. I may have tapped out after the second event, the second messenger that came to tell me that all the cattle and the oxen and everything else and my servants are all dead but two. I may have just said, I'm done. But he went on and lost all his camels, then he loses all of his children, and it says he fell down on the earth and worshiped. Verse 21, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sin not, nor charge God foolishly. Wow. I don't even want to think that I might be able to do that. I'm encouraged that a human could do that, but I don't know if I could. I don't know if I would. So chapter 2 comes along, and guess what? Satan goes back up for a visit with God, and now God gives him permission to attack his health. And as you see, and that's another picture of um, uh, the tribulation where Job is afflicted with boils, and that's one of the plagues that will happen during the tribulation. And Job has these boils all over him, and he sits down on an ash heap, and he just takes a piece of pottery and starts scraping all the pus and everything off, and he's in rough shape. But then, just to make things wor worse, his wife says, Dost thou retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. Now, there's a help meet for you. You're going through a difficult time, and that's your response. Why don't we just bail, curse God, let him kill you, and get this over with? And then, let's take a look at uh, Job's response in verse 10. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. Notice, gentlemen, he did not call her a fool. Honest, sincere conversation in the midst of tremendous emotional and physical pain, and he doesn't call his wife a fool. He says, You speak as a foolish woman, but does not call her a fool or any other name. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did Job not sin with his lips. Wow. So let me ask you, generally, what is thought to be the theme of Job? What's that? Suffering? What else? Persecution? Why do the righteous suffer? Thank you, Rick. What's that? 
Perseverance, yeah. I mean, he did make it to chapter 42. But why do the righteous suffer? Think about that statement. There's a lot of assumptions behind that statement. One of them is my life as a Christian in this Old Testament as a believer, my life ought to go a whole lot different because of my faith in God. When we say, why do the righteous suffer? It's almost to say that we are right and who is wrong? God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. All my righteousness are as filthy rags. I am only righteous because I am in Christ. I am not righteous because of my own merit or my own good works or anything else. So when we say, why do the righteous suffer, it's almost like someone made an attempt to live right or serve the Lord, and therefore nothing should go wrong in their lives. Why shouldn't we suffer? Jesus even told the disciples, in this life ye shall have tribulation. It's going to come. He said, if they persecuted the master, they will persecute the servants as well. So let me ask you this. What was Job's sin? Perfect, upright, skewed evil, feared the Lord. What was Job's sin? We don't know. We don't know if there is one. We don't know what it is. But God picked him to pick a fight with the devil. Did he have this sin before the calamity struck him? Lamentations 3.21, This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The only reason I got up this morning is because of God's compassion and mercy and faithfulness. He did not need me today, but I needed him. He didn't need me. He wasn't going like, man, get the, somebody wakes sour up. Look what we got to do today. God had never crossed his mind. But out of his mercies and compassions, I am alive today. So let's go to Job chapter 32. Uh, we did not get any offerings on uh, anybody's suggestion for what Job's sin was. But let's take a look in chapter 32 and see if we can get an indication of what this book is trying to illuminate for us. Now, was Job a sinner? Absolutely. I'm not saying that he wasn't, but we don't know what sins he had. Amen? But notice in Job chapter 32, uh, this is Elihu, if you remember from the different players there. Uh, Elihu is, um, you don't hear him speak. He's there the entire time, kind of like the Holy Spirit, picture of the Holy Spirit. He's there the entire time, listening to the conversation, taking notes, but he does not speak until chapter 32. So from chapter 3 to 31, it's Job and the three supposed friends and their discourse. And this is what Elihu says was the issue in verse 2. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, had a little problem with the bottle, of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was his wrath kindled because what? He justified himself rather than God. Doesn't, doesn't that sound like, why do the righteous suffer? Doesn't that sound like a justification of ourselves and our lives and a questioning of God's character? He says, Job, I've listened to you talk for these 29 chapters, and what I've heard is that you're justifying yourself rather than justifying God. So let's take a look, because justification is an important term to us theologically, for theology, uh, to uh, justify or to be justified is to pardon and clear from all guilt, to absolve or acquit from guilt and merited punishment, and to accept as righteous on account of the merits of the Savior or by the application of Christ's atonement to the offender. That 
how we got our justification, not because we deserved it. Some people say that justified is just as if I never sinned, and that's what the blood of Christ does for us, completely cleanses us of past, present, and future sin judiciously. Judiciously before God, we are just as if we had never sinned, not because of our merit, but because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But there's also a personal definition for justify, which I believe is what Elihu was getting at when he said to Job that he justified himself rather than God, and that is to cause another to appear comparatively righteous or less guilty than oneself. This definition of justify is to provide an explanation or rationale for something to make it seem okay or to prove that it is okay to do. So Job's issue through this book is that he tried to justify that he did not deserve what happened to him, and in doing that, he condemned God. Did Job deserve all that? Think about that. When I committed my first sin, what did I deserve? Hell. I deserved to go to hell. Did I say, hey, I'm going to commit this sin because I like going to where it's warm? No, I didn't say, I'm going to sin because I want God's curse on my life. I'm going to sin because I want to go. I didn't say that. But when I sinned, what did I deserve? To go to hell. And it's only of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. So did Job do something out of his own will and volition to, to warrant how he just got treated by Satan? I would dare say no. Do we all deserve something like that because of sin? Yes, because I don't think we understand, myself included, how much sin offends and hurts God. I just, I don't understand that. So, so let's take a look. See how Job tries to justify himself. Job 9, 20. This is, this is really on his mind throughout the book. If I justify myself, now here he speaks pretty uh, soundly. If I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. So as this, this, this play, this act takes place, at the beginning, he says, I know if I say I'm justified, if I'm right, and I don't deserve this, I know that's wrong to say it. But then you look when you get to chapter 13, behold now, I have ordered my cause, I know that I shall be justified. So all of a sudden, because of the three so-called friends around him, Job's attention has turned to looking justified in front of them. And in doing that, he condemns God for what God allowed to happen to him. See why I'd rather preach on Thanksgiving? Maybe I could do the five love languages of an athlete. We have a pretty good idea. Starts with beef brisket, it moves down through candy and things like that. I would much rather uh, preach on that tonight. But Job was consumed with the idea of justifying himself. And as he went through that process, he ends up condemning God. Go to chapter 33, just show you one verse quickly here. Job 33. Elihu again speaking in verse 12. Um, Behold, in this thou art not just, I will answer thee that God is greater than man. Who are we to think that we can tell God how to run the universe? Go over to chapter 40. Now, from chapter 1 and chapter 2, God is having this discourse with Satan and the sons of God and allows Satan to uh, do his thing, what he does to Job. And then from 3 through chapter 37, it's all the three guys, Job and Elihu, speaking And then God begins to speak in chapter 38. And if you ever want to take a quiz that you will absolutely fail, try to answer all the questions that God asks from chapter 38 through 42. 
Chapter 40, verse 1, Moreover the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. Then Job answered and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? This is after uh, two chapters of God just peppering him with questions. I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. Then answered the Lord unto Job out of a whirlwind and said, Gird up thy loins like now like a man. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me, Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be made righteous? May I submit the greatest test in being tested is not getting through the emotional or the physical pain but it's the idea of condemning God for what he allowed to happen to us. That's God speaking himself and said, are you going to disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be made righteous? That's that justification that Job was trying to seek amongst humans, and in doing so, ends up offending God. It's kind of like when people break up. Have you ever noticed that? I love Facebook. Facebook has become the new liquid courage, right? Remember back in my day, liquid courage was you didn't have the guts to ask somebody out, so you put a half pint away, and then hey, and then they still wouldn't go out with you, and you look like an idiot even worse. So now Facebook is the new liquid courage. I'm going to break up with you on Facebook. You coward how we can say all these things. And what happens whenever we break up with someone or a relationship, whatever it may be, there's issues there. See, I've got to get out in front of the other person and justify myself why this happened. So I'll go to Facebook, I'll go to Twitter, I'll go to whatever, I'll get a plane and put it in the sky. But I've got to make sure everybody knows that I'm right and the other person is wrong and that's why we broke up. That's what Job experienced, and that's what Job did. He said, I can't be wrong. It's got to be God. It's got to be God. And God asked, will thou disannul my judgment that thou might condemn me? The struggle for us is to accept the difficult things in life as God's will for his glory. Matthew 16, Jesus is having a discussion with the disciples and kind of really gets them by the shoulders and says, guys, listen, I'm not going to be here forever. Very shortly, I will be crucified. I will be slain. I will be killed by the Roman government being pushed by the Pharisees and religious sects of that day. And then Jesus rebukes him and says, no way, dude. (laughs) You're the man. You got to stick around. What are we going to do if you're gone? You cannot die. And Jesus' response is, verse 23, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Why? For thou savorest not the things that be of God and those that be of men. In other words, what he is saying is, this is God's will for somebody to suffer so that others reap the benefit of that. And Peter, you are talking like Satan in that you do not savor You do not cherish, you do not relish the things of God over your own comfort. Revelation 4.11 says that thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and what? For thy pleasure they are and were created. We were created for God's pleasure. Now, pleasure to us has a certain connotation to it, that life is going to go well. Amen? Amen. May I remind us in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 10, yet it what? Please the Lord to bruise him. You say, can you explain that? No. Other than he was thinking about us. How do you explain God the Father getting pleasure out of bruising his son except there was a room full of people that needed a Savior? We were created for his pleasure. And if God wants to use 
me to put a stick in Satan's eye and God gets pleasure from it. Just pray for me. I don't know how long I would last if something happened to me like it did to Job. But if God gets pleasure out of it, I don't want to disannul his judgment. I don't want to be like Peter, voicing Satan's words and not savoring the things that be of God. So handling difficulties. Let's just go through a few things that maybe you're in the midst of something right now. Maybe I remember Pastor Gray saying, You're either going into some trouble, you're either in the middle of trouble, or you're coming out of trouble, but you're going to have trouble your whole life. And doesn't it feel like that? Here's a great verse from Job. Man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. And it just put it on my tombstone. (laughs) That's me. (laughs) Can't do carpentry, can't do automotive, uh, some are thinking can't preach. So um, man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. That's us. That's this life. So if you're going through something right now, may these words be encouraging. Number one, fight the temptation of trying to justify yourself in the eyes of others. Whether it is a breakup of a relationship, maybe it's the loss of a job. Stupid boss, the guy's a moron. Well, a couple of weeks ago at the party, you thought he was the greatest guy in the world when he was handing out bonuses. See how we have to justify ourselves. And when God does things drastic like happened with Job, it's almost like we got to get out in front of the curve. I haven't sinned. I didn't cheat on my wife. I didn't steal anything from the bank. I didn't take anything from the guys at the office. See, we've got to get out. And I, so I don't know why. What's the next question? I don't know why God's doing this to me. And what happens? We end up disannulling his judgment and condemning him without saying those words, just asking the question, I don't know why God is. Job, I don't know if God let Job in on the conversation of chapter one and chapter two. I don't know if Job ever got understanding. Where we run into difficulties when we try to justify ourselves is we want to understand why something is happening. And God doesn't always give us an answer. I don't like that. If you see, because if he would say it was this, this, and this, guess what I would change? I would change this, this, and this, thinking that this will never happen to me again, right? So be very careful. Resist the temptation of trying to justify yourself to others. Number two, friends may not know how to help or deal with our situation or your situation. You know, uh, Mike Metzger, you know, he is not one of the three friends of Job. He's one of them guys that can walk into a hospital room and just, it's, it's almost like they're expecting Mike to heal the person. He just has that gift of mercy. Let me tell you about my most recent, second most recent hospital visit. Went to see a family. Uh, we knew the, the, my, the husband and wife. The wife was dying, so went up to spend some time with the husband and we talked outside the room. The family was gathered all around the bed. And uh, then we came in, and uh, the husband said, this is uh, Pastor Gary from our church, and introduced me to everyone, and uh, just stood there by the bed and chatting. And then uh, Mike, uh, I'm sorry, then the fellow says, would you like to pray for us? And I said, yeah, let's pray. Somebody says, good. Because after you pray, you can leave because you're really not doing a good job comforting us. Uh, I just don't do well in hospitals. Now, I did go over and play with the button for the bed and stuff. I didn't squeeze the bag. You know, the eyes got bigger. I'm just not good in hospitals. I am not Pastor Mike. I, you know, I, I'm hitting the button. I thought it was ordering food. The nurses all run in, code blue, paddles out. Um, I don't do well in that situation. Pastor Mike can. Remember, when you're in a difficult time and you say, I'm not getting all this help that I thought I would from other people, they, they may not know what to say or do. We need to have a little compassion on them. Job's, besides these three guys, his friends don't show up until chapter 42 when everything is good. When all the cattle's returned and, and doubled and all the kids come back, 
they're nowhere to be found. So remember, when you're going through something difficult, your friends may not know what to say or how to help you. Number three, you'll enjoy this one. Others will know exactly what God is doing in your life more than you will. Have you ever had that happen? Oh, I know why that happened. I'm sure you do. You live here. That's just human nature. They're going to, and that's what the three friends did. They take 29 chapters of just berating Job and telling him everything about himself that he supposedly doesn't know and why God did it. Number four, difficulties are not always due to a particular sin, but God still uses them to refine us. You know, the burning the dross off of the silver so that the silver is pure. And I heard this illustration in the old days, a goldsmith, they would put all the the raw materials in a pot, set it on the fire, and uh, then as the fire got hotter, they lift the lid off and they would take their big scooper and they'd take all the dross, the impurities that would go to the surface and scrape them off. And the goldsmith would do that over and over and over again until when he lifted the lid and looked in the pot, he saw his reflection. So when God puts me on his furnace, what he is looking for is to burn that dross off so that when he looks at me, he sees the reflection of his son. And I don't like that. But it's not always, man, if I could just figure out, no, no, maybe there's just something there God is molding and making and shaping us. Don't be surprised if you drift in and out of good spiritual thinking when you're going through a difficult time. And I'll just give you this for sake of time, Job 13, Job 19. Uh, let me just say the verse, uh, Job 13, 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Now, isn't that, that's a good statement, isn't it? And then in Job 19, he says, for I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Doesn't it sound like he's thinking coherently there, spiritually? But yet you read other things he says in this book, and it's like, whoa, is he saved? So don't be surprised when you go through a difficult time if your thoughts go in and out of good spiritual thinking. And number six, difficulties in our lives can be to help others. A great one in Genesis chapter 50 where Joseph said, Uh, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. You think about Abraham having to offer his son Isaac or be willing to. You think of Elisha being encircled by the Syrian army at Dothan, and God opens the eyes of the servant, and you see chariots of fire all around the town. You think about Paul in prison. Paul wrote half the New Testament, and half the New Testament that Paul wrote was written from prison. Some great letters. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the difficulties they went through, and Daniel, and yet we learn from that. We grow from that. How about the cross? A difficulty that someone went through that we learned from. See, I don't know who's watching me. I don't know who's watching you. Maybe somebody lost at work or somebody in your family, and the difficulty you go through If you can get by like Job and not curse God, it may have a profound effect on their salvation. It may have a profound effect on their spiritual growth if they're saved. Somebody is watching all of us. And when God decides to poke the eye of the devil with our lives, praise the Lord. Because maybe somebody else will get eternity because of it. So, what are some things that go through our minds? Really quickly, what, do you th- what are some things that go through our minds when we go through a difficult time? Why? Why? Okay. What did I do? What else? What are you doing, God? When's it going to be over? You know, there's no reference in the book of Job to say how long this lasted. That stinks. What else? How about, uh, what is it, Mark? Did you say it? What, what can I learn from this? Yeah, what can I learn from this? How about whose fault is it? Why did this happen to me? How about how they live? Why didn't this happen to them? 
Did God do this or did he just allow it? I've already repented of that sin. Why do I have these consequences? And those are things that go through our mind. So I just want to give you some verses just to help us with our minds. We need to renew our minds. It tells us that in uh, Romans chapter 12. Uh, we're told in Hebrews chapter 12, we have to be caref careful not to faint in our minds. Um, so how about this? Next time we go through a challenge and we're struggling with feelings, what we have to do is attach ourselves to facts. Amen? When the feelings are, God, I have no idea what you're doing and I'm about ready to curse you, we need to go back to what the facts are. Here's a great fact. Deuteronomy 32. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. Psalms 33, for the word of the Lord is what? Right, and all his works are done in truth. Psalms 145, 17, the Lord is righteous in all of his ways and holy in all his works. So when we go through something that's very difficult, we need to go back to verses like that and renew our minds and realize what the character of God is like. We won't take time, but read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and then let's leave with uh, this verse, Romans eleven thirty three. 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Pastor Kevin? Still, sorry. 